joining us today for this spring update of the Edelman Trust Barometer. It's a special edition of the Trust Barometer looking at the impact of COVID. Now, look, as you know, the Trust Barometer is an examination of trust over the last 20 years. We've tracked the rise and fall of four public institutions, of government, of media, of business, of NGOs, and we've asked the pertinent questions of the day. Now, every year we publish our study in January, but of course, with the COVID pandemic and institutions facing an unprecedented crisis, we thought we should go back into the field to understand how attitudes have changed. So this morning, I'm going to tell you about what we found. We're also going to hear from Hugh Taggart, my colleague, he's our global crisis chair and head of corporate affairs in the UK, about what we believe the implications are for business action in particular. I'm also going to bring in three of our UK advisory board members, Lord Brown, uh, Dame Helena Morrissey, and Sir John Soares, who are joined today by Pippa Crea. I mean, look, you will know John Brown from his writing, his time at BP, and his campaigning and passion for science and for engineering. Uh, leading, as he does, the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering and chairing the Francis Crick Institute. Helena Morrissey has spent her career in finance, notably as CEO of Newton Investment Management, where she took the firm's assets under management from 20 billion to 50 billion. Uh, she is an author and campaigner, and for many years now, she has been a leading light, a leading campaigner on gender equality, establishing the 30% Club, pressing for greater female representation on boards. Pippa Creo is the political editor of The Mirror, and the current chair of the Parliamentary Press Gallery. She was formerly deputy political editor of The Guardian, and for many years she was city hall editor of The Standard, covering one Boris Johnson, so as such probably knows more and understands more about the PM and how he ticks than most other people covering politics today. And finally, Sir John Soares was a career diplomat and senior civil servant. He was Tony Blair's principal foreign policy advisor, ambassador to Egypt and the UN. He was our man in Iraq not long after the invasion and was chief of the secret intelligence service MI6. He's now executive chairman of Newbridge Advisory where he advises corporate leaders on geopolitics and political risk. So it's going to be a fantastically interesting discussion to come. But first the data to set it all up and forgive me I'm going to go at pace here because uh, there's a lot to impart with you. Okay, first slide, the key headline, exceptional times are producing extraordinary trust barometer results. We have found the highest aggregate trust scores across business, government, media and, and NGOs in our 20 years of studying trust. Fear, large scale, multivariable fear, seems to have driven a particular type of trust in the system. Through necessity perhaps, but, the surge in levels of trust across the board tells us something pretty unusual is going on. Much more unusual than we saw in the data after 9-11 and the 08-09 financial crisis when trust also ticked up. And it's that historic perspective on trust uh, that tells us after a rapid trust rise, we tend to see a fall. Fast descents cannot be sustained. I cannot believe this is going to be a case of Boris and the great glass elevator with trust levels piercing the atmosphere and defying gravity. But, you know, pause for a moment, I think, you know, put to one side the context of the UK over the last week, but these numbers on the face of it present a unique opportunity for institutions to buck the trend of decline and denigration of the system that we've seen of late. It's an opportunity for them to demonstrate value. But how fleeting is this period? what leadership is required to preserve and build on public trust? These are the big questions. Perhaps some advice then on those on the panel later. But if you travel in the other direction from the glass elevator, dig into the crust, you see a far more fragile state of trust than the headline numbers suggest. We found evidence of significant levels of fear and people remain very worried about their well-being in part because governments are perceived to be failing on getting medical equipment and protective equipment to people. 
while businesses seem to be falling short on looking after the health of workers and customers. Moreover, there are big fears about jobs. Now, look, job security predated the COVID pandemic. People were already worried about automation, globalization, workforce reductions, and an economic downturn back in January. But now layer on top of that, anxiety about job losses and the state of the labor market as a result of coronavirus. We've also found evidence of another pre-COVID issue. And it's an important one in the context of the global pandemic. Big question marks over information quality and sourcing. Concern about fake news was high before the pandemic, but in the context of COVID, two thirds worry about it. And about half of people say they are finding it hard to find reliable, trustworthy information about the virus. Now, in recent years, we've talked about the mass class divide. That's the gap between those with income, education and information and how they think about the institutions versus everybody else. We saw that gap first in the US, the UK and France. It spread to Canada and Germany. And then we saw it in India and the Middle East in data recently. But what the pandemic seems to have done is concentrate a two tier system in people's minds. Around two thirds of people say that it has a, they, they have a heightened awareness now of the division between the affluent and those on lower income. And that action must now be taken to make the system fairer. And a similar proportion say the poorest are unfairly burdened by the public health crisis and are suffering and making, making the greatest sacrifice because of it. Now, perhaps the most remarkable findings this, this year or this, in this data set is the complete reshuffling of the institutional trust deck. Trust in government has surged in the last five months by a staggering 11 points, making government the most trusted institution in the world for the first time in 20 years of study. We've never seen anything like this. But truly, none of us really have ever experienced circumstances like this either. But people have turned to government for a response, the neoliberal paradigm that's been so dominant since the Thatcher, Reagan, Reagan era and the fall of Berlin Wall, the view that government should kind of get out of the way, uh, we should be allowed to get on, our our, get on with our lives and leave things to the private sector, that is not holding true anymore. People want big government and this is a far more pronounced declaration of faith in, public, in the public sector than we've ever seen before. Again, how firm this view is, whether we're seeing a permanent shift in attitude is unclear. But let me focus in on the UK here. Um, it is, uh, you know, given where we sit today, quite an extraordinary story, a 24 point catapult in trust in government. It's the biggest in our study. We also saw a similar surge in trust in government leaders too. You know, I, I, in, in our case, trust in the prime minister is up 25 points. And Boris Johnson's dramatic personal struggle played out through the media will likely be elevating these numbers, I would suggest. I mean, I think the performance of the NHS, the strong economic response by the treasury and clear government communications early on in the first phase, the stay home messaging, I think is driving, has driven trust in government more generally. But again, underneath those numbers, the picture is quite mixed. While the public believe the government took the necessary action to keep the economy from collapsing and the initial stay home, protect the NHS, save lives messaging was well understood. The perception is that the UK has performed poorly on testing, poorly on PPE and has not adequately helped the sick living in the poorest areas. Which to me rather suggests that while trust in government in the UK is up, it could be heading for a fall, particularly when you think about the challenges ahead. Challenges like the ones we saw this week with the shift in messaging and the criticism over the lack of clarity and precision. You know, the ongoing tragedy of COVID-19 in care homes. But there is no escaping the fact that around the world, government is seen as the strongest institution to lead across all aspects of this pandemic. You might think that people would expect media to take the lead on informing the public. Wrong. 
its government. You might think that people would expect business to take the lead on providing an economic response and support. Wrong, it's government. You might think that people would expect charities and NGOs to take the lead on helping people in the community. Wrong, again, it's government. In short, government is centre stage at the moment. Indeed, the trust in government we see is now being transferred into other areas of life. For example, the exchange of personal data for safety. Look, as you can see here, people are prepared to trade off privacy, location data and health data to stay safe. The need for technology that tracks and traces the virus is broadly accepted in the UK. 59% of people are happy to provide health and location data to keep the virus at bay. Whether this is a temporary permission space or a more permanent shift in the public's attitude to the state's application of their own data, we'll see, I suspect, in the adoption levels of the app and usage, moreover. Now, let's turn to what's happening with trust in media. Trust in media, in traditional media, is at an all-time high. And I think, despite all of the silly conspiracy theories and fake news fears, this is, in some respects, less remarkable. People are tuning in, hungry for information, and they're consuming and reading news in enormously large numbers. It's evident in our research, as much as, frankly, it's evident in the viewing figures of the BBC and the other network broadcasters, as well as the national newspapers. Why do people trust media more? Well, I suspect it's because traditional media, television, radio, newspapers, are seen by and large as neutral platforms for experts. Media, I would argue, has done an excellent job in putting up scientists, government officials, and academics to explain the situation clearly and in great detail. They've avoided confected rows, so the signal to noise ratio has been good. People need facts and mainstream media has been giving them those. And if you look at the most trusted voices, the figures bear that theory out. Those you see most on media, doctors, scientists, national health officials, the top of the pile. I should say, actually, uh, the figures along the bottom uh, show the change since we asked that question of trust in experts earlier in the year. And as you can see, the World Health Organization officials have taken a big trust hit down eight points, perhaps over the allegations that the WHO is too close to China. CEOs have seen an increase since March, but they aren't up in the kind of trust zone yet. It's why we argue that CEOs need to share platforms with other trusted experts. So if government is in the front seat in responding to the crisis, it follows, and we see this in the data, that business is in the back seat. People have looked to business to get them through this. And it's, uh, sorry, forgive me, people have looked to a government to get through this. And actually, in some respects, that's shielded business. But if we think government trust is a fragile bubble, business, therefore, could find itself very quickly pushed right at the front if and when the bubble bursts. It's not enough to be passengers. Our hypothesis is that this is a key generational moment for business. The decisions companies make now and how they communicate them are vitally important for the here and now, yes, but crucially and more so for post-crisis relationships. But as we see restrictions being lifted, this is a moment loaded with risk for business. The public is still minded to put economic and job considerations to one side. By a margin of two to one, people would rather government take the economic hit and save as many lives as possible, rather than restarting the economy and saving jobs. In the UK, 73% of people feel this way. That makes the gradual easing of lockdown to get the economy moving challenging for the government and hard to for business to push without building confidence in the safety of the workplace and strategies in place to control the virus. But there's no getting away from it. As government steps back, and it will at some point, companies will have to step in. This is particularly challenging when the perception is that CEOs are currently falling short in responding to the pandemic. Fair or not, they are seen as being absent in this crisis. They're bottom of the pack of trusted uh, globally, trusted leaders globally, and particularly here in the UK. 
honestly, I have some sympathy here. Many business leaders have been fighting hard to make sure they have viable businesses. They understandably have been focused on jobs and on livelihoods. And I think people will get that. But there are clear expectations that CEOs must now play a public leadership role too. Increasingly so as we move into these next phases, 65% of people want CEOs to take the lead rather than being passengers of government action. Final two points on two, um, two key drivers of trust, competence and integrity. Back in January, business was seen as the most competent of all four institutions. But in response to COVID-19, business is not seen to be acting as competently as it needs to. On getting products and services to those in need, on protecting employees and getting geared up for the eventual recovery. This is obviously a major problem and risk. Acting with integrity, business has always struggled on this ethical dimension. But the pandemic is putting a spotlight on companies like never before, on putting People before profits, looking after employees' financial well-being and helping support supply chains and customers. People say actually business is coming up short on those attributes at the moment. Business leaders have talked about stakeholder capitalism over serving shareholders for a long time now. And it's clear we are now at the moment when stated intent is being put to the test. How companies are seen to respond, whether they seem to be playing their part or failing to do so, is going to have a significant impact on trust in business as we move forward. So with that, I'm going to briefly hand over to Hugh, uh, who's going to talk about uh, what this all means for companies and how they should act. Hugh. Thanks, Ed. Uh, before I get into how companies should think about leading and communicating now and in the future, I want to first highlight some of the key actions that people expect from business that were highlighted in the survey. As you can see from the findings, there is a clear expectation for companies to mobilise and to mobilise really quickly against the virus, to partner and work with their peers and their competitors, to switch production to meet the urgent needs of their communities, and to make this critical battle core to their mission. But companies need to think really carefully about where their permission space is, where their brand has licence to, to go and show up credibly in the eyes of their audiences and how they communicate this to meet and exceed the expectations of their stakeholders. And fundamental to this is understanding the various phases of the crisis and the dynamic environment that businesses are operating in. So as you can see, we've now moved from the initial continuity phase of the crisis and into the stability phase. And it's in this stage that companies need to continue to build hope, defining themselves as not having an extractive relationship with society, but playing a supportive and indispensable role. Without question, the watchwords in this phase for business are partnership and collaboration, whether that be with industry bodies, with NGOs or government. It's about demonstrating how you're changing and adapting to the environment around you and innovating, even in small, really practical ways to improve the situations of your immediate audiences. And there's also in this phase, the reintroduction of commercial messaging. And this should be done through the prism of how businesses are actually helping people. Only by being seen to solve some of the problems that have been presented by the pandemic can businesses earn the permission to sell products and services. And now, rightly, companies are lifting their sights to the recovery phase. Decision makers in business must now ask themselves how do companies mitigate the worst of the impact and adapt for the medium term? And central to this adjustment will be building that renewed sense of confidence amongst the communities in which business operate. And business can do this by beginning to introduce and engage with the new normal practices. Reintroducing commercial messages if they haven't been done in the previous phase and mixing new brand activity with some of the relevant historical elements of the brand that may have been put on hold for COVID. And then visibly contributing to the acceleration of societal and the economic recovery. And it's at this point that companies will start asking, what should that new brand DNA look like? What's the renewed business purpose of our organization? And how is this going to shape the role that we are going to be playing in society going forward? 
Next slide. And all of this thinking and planning then needs to be packaged and communicated in a timely way to ensure that it is relevant to and trusted by both internal and external audiences. And business can do this in a number of ways. Highlighting the positive contribution that they are making to the recovery, connecting with their audiences in a way that highlights their values, and convincing their audiences that the products and services that the company is delivering come back to the values of the organization and also meet the needs of their audiences. And then develop appropriate commercial messaging that prompts activity and drives sales. Now, critical to the success of these programs will be communicating in a way that is empathetic and mindful of the heightened sensitivities of this period. People want clear information about the steps that the company is taking to support its stakeholders, both emotionally and also practically. Sales messaging that is detached from the reality of those lives, of the people's lives, will at best fall flat and at worst inflict longer term brand damage. So before we get into the panel discussion, I want to conclude with four key takeaways for business. First, show up and do your part. As Ed said, absenteeism is going to be punished. Business now needs to get into the driver's seat. Companies that act with confidence and show their value and also their values will be the ones that succeed. Second, don't always feel the need to act alone. Partner with other companies and with government to achieve more than you could possibly hope to while in isolation. Third, sell by solving. Only by providing solutions to the challenges that have been thrown up by this pandemic will business earn the right to be heard and also earn the right to sell. And finally, communicate with emotion, with compassion and with facts. This has always been true, but the pitfalls of tonal missteps are now deeper and the consequences more severe than ever before. And with that, I'm going to hand back to Ed who will open up the discussion with the panel. Hugh, that is brilliant. Thanks very much. So hopefully you can all see uh, the uh, great panel um, on the screen uh, now. Um, so, um, Lord Brown, I'd like to come to you first. I mean, looking at the findings in the round, are you surprised by um, what we've set out? Uh, so, good morning. No, I'm not, not surprised at all. Uh, I think that very situation dependent, obviously, uh, results. First, I think it, it shows that people have an acute understanding of what's relevant today. And what was relevant in the face of this monumental crisis created by nature was the protection of citizens and the protection of their health. And who could do that? Not, no one except government. So government were the most relevant thing and uh, they did just that. They marshaled a lot of resources, sometimes effectively, sometimes uh, subject to criticism uh, for health and well-being. Uh, but also they effectively nationalized the, the payroll uh, and provide people with, in most cases, uh, some uh, a wage to keep going in the face of massive economic dislocation. So I think that doesn't really surprise me. Uh, I think the uh, findings on business don't surprise me as well. I think for the period of time when the crisis was building, they probably were less relevant to everybody than government. Government, after all, is uh, there to protect citizens. And that's what was really important to people. There is, however, I think uh, a lot of uh, concern about what happens next and whether the trust will be maintained and who the actors who are relevant for the future, who will they be? Thanks, John. So uh, we'll come back to what next for business later on in this discussion, because I'd like to ask your advice, particularly about CEOs. Um, Dame Helena Morrissey, I mean, you know this government uh, well. Um, uh, you know, you're, you, you, you follow uh, politics very closely. What's your assessment of why the UK government and Boris in particular has seen this extraordinary surge in trust? Well, I think you mentioned one of the factors, Ed, and obviously uh, that was Boris Johnson's personal struggle. Um, your survey was conducted between the 15th of April and the 23rd, and he had just emerged from hospital with his uh, brush with death. Um, so I think that probably uh, explains some of it, as you've already alluded to. But I think as well, 
I mean, this country obviously has been uh, very divided for a number of years, uh, particularly over Brexit. And we know, as, as uh, Lord Brown has just alluded to, when the stress of disaster does tend to bring people together. And I think some of the initiatives that the government took in the early weeks and the things that developed um, in our communities certainly helped to create a sense of togetherness um, that I think rightly was attributed um, at the time to what the government was doing. So, I mean, very obvious example, the collapse for the NHS workers has been a great binding force. We saw party politics largely cast aside. The slogans initially were simple and clear. And I think most people felt that the economic measures taken were strong and robust. You know, the chancellor committed in the early days to doing whatever it takes um, to get us through this. So it looked as though the government was in control after a bit of a wobble over the herd immunity issues and, and delays around lockdown, had daily communications that were very strong and clear. And it was very clear what our priorities were as a nation to stop the spread of the virus, flatten the curve, save the NHS. And at that time, I think as well, it felt um, to many of us that the virus was a great equalizer that this didn't divide um, people that were all at risk equally. And of course, we now know um, in a few short weeks, three weeks uh, since uh, the data was collected, that um, perhaps it has exacerbated uh, the inequalities <coughs> in our society. Um, I did just want to briefly comment on the sustainability of this, the leap that the government's seen. I know that others on the panel are going to take that point, but I think it, it is important that we do look upon this as it's probably the peak moment for, the, for our government. Uh, perhaps the next phase was bound to be trickier, um, but we are seeing obviously doubts cast over the validity and workings of the scientific models that appear to have informed the government. Um, and we've obviously seen other countries fare much better. Um, some people are arguing that Britain now has the worst of both worlds, more deaths and more economic damage. We've had the lack of testing, tracing and issues over PPE. And I think the government needs to focus now on, um, you know, improving the transparency around the information that is um, being driving its policy um, if they're going to sustain the leap in trust. I don't think they'll be able to sustain it at this particular high level, but to maintain positive ratings. Uh, so John Saws, um, to um, Helena's point, are we at peak trust for government? Is this as good as it gets? Well, there's a risk of that, very much so. Uh, I agree with Helena's uh, analysis of the risks ahead. Uh, getting into lockdown and closing down the economy is a whole lot easier than opening it up whilst the uh, virus is still in the community. And I think that you call it trust, Ed. I think there's a large element in here of hope. People are looking to the government in the hope that government is going to be able to uh, res resolve these problems. Um, and we've got a pretty good history in our country. Uh, obviously, you, we can all point to uh, bad uh, periods of poor government, but uh, in, in, in the sort of long sweep of history, <coughs> our government has done pretty well in terms of looking after the interests of the uh, of, uh, of British people. But I think it's going to boil down to competence, which is what Helena, I think, was saying. It, are we going to be competent as we emerge out of this lockdown uh, and keep the virus under control because if we have more of the incompetence that was on show back in March and bluster and uh, lack of uh, lack of uh, authority and confidence and consistency then I think that uh, those trust numbers uh, will be will will come down as the hopes are disappointed. Uh, Pippa, uh, John's point about competence. I mean, there's been a lot of criticism of the competence of government, um, particularly in their messaging or the uh, effectiveness of their messaging over the course of the last week. Do you think that's entirely fair? Because we are moving into a much more complicated phase where actually there's going to be grey areas and nuance and increasingly individuals are going to have to operate as their own sort of statistician, if you like, managing their own personal risks. So competence, you know, is, the gov is, that, is that a fair criticism of government? I think it's right that competence going forward will be at the heart of it. And, you know, I've spoken to people in government who say they believe that the public will forgive their mistakes going into the lockdown, but that they won't be forgiving the mistakes coming out of it. But, you know, it is, it is also true to say that any change in the stay-at-home messaging is going to be fraught with difficulty, because as you've rightly identified, it's a much more nuanced message and relies much more on the public applying what the government describes as the great British, British public, um, great British common sense. Mm -hmm. um, but it's no surprise that this is a more nuanced stage 
and everybody in government was aware that it was going to be a much more nuanced message that they would have to promote. So um, when you look at, for example, how the trade unions responded to the workplace guidance once the detail was actually published and there was a cautious welcome to it, you kind of think, well, why did they do it the other way around? And you'll remember, I'm sure, that Boris Johnson at Prime Minister's Question Time last week blurted out, whether deliberately or not, I don't know, that some of the changes would be coming in on Monday. Now, everyone in government knew that even if the changes were, were from Monday, there was going to have to be regulation laid in the Commons, which meant that it would be able to take place for a couple of days. And it's not just um, him, him last Wednesday. I mean, for a couple of weeks now, government has been briefing to various publications that the lifting the lockdown measures um, was going to be coming. I mean, I remember writing a story, a very similar story appeared on the front page of the Times and the Telegraph and the Mirror. So this was not sort of a party political thing um, about some of the about some of the route out. And um, you know, this came from established government sources. And then very quickly they wrote back on it when they realised the public was saying, "Well, where's the detail?" So it's um, you know, it, but it felt this weekend very much like that they should have done it the other way around. That there should have been a statement in the Commons to the Prime Minister on Monday. A lot of people don't understand why the Sunday night statement happened. Um, followed by all the detail um, and then, then the statement to the public so that everybody, when they finished listening to Boris Johnson on the telly, could go to their to go online and check out the exact detail and there wouldn't have been this confusion. And I'm afraid it's quite hard to get away from the feeling that that, that Putin wanted Boris Johnson, wanted the Prime Minister to have his big moment. I mean, there he was behind his desk, all very Chilean. We know how he channels all of that. Um, but the flip side of that, you know, and there was a massive TV audience and it was worth saying that um, they made it into the front rooms of, you know, almost half the country. Um, I think the only it was bigger than the, the Olympics opening, cer opening ceremony in terms of um, in terms of numbers. Not quite as big as Charles and Diana's um, uh, wedding, but it was it was a huge number. Um, so you know, they they got that message out there. But the problem was that a lot of it was slightly confused. People weren't sure they were going back to work on the Monday. Um, and the flip side of it obviously makes it feel like it was. All about him. I mean, why did they do it on the Sunday? Why did they have to? So, I think as well as some of the, the lack of clarity that has emerged over the last few days, and the, and the, some of the confusion as a result of it, um, there's also this questioning about the government's motivations. And I think they're going to have to try and get that back on track now. And I mean, you know the Prime Minister well from your time uh, covering uh, City Hall for the Evening Standard when um, Boris Johnson was mayor. Um, uh, the the leadership uh, required now in the, this next phase obviously requires a huge amount of kind of coalition building and partnership. Um, does that play to his strengths? Well, you know, I mean, the opposition, Keir Starmer has said, of course, that he wants a national consensus. And certainly, whether it's lip service or not, there does seem to be an understanding amongst the main opposition parties that the public expects a more um, collegiate response to all of this. This is not a time for party politics and that's you know fed through to the media as well. I mean we as a, a Labour supporting paper have tried very hard not to be sort of party political but to be partisan about it. Um, and certainly Boris Johnson's experience up until the time he entered government was very much one of reaching out. I mean he had people who were Labour MPs on his team, he had people of you know all different types of political backgrounds and no political backgrounds on his team at City Hall. And he generally seemed to be a sort of consensus building um, politician. Um, you know, I mean, let's not forget that he was a conservative politician that won in London, which is widely regarded in London anyway as a Labour city. So, you know, he has that he has the capacity to reach out to voters that that um, to the public um, that other politicians don't have. Now, as Helena mentioned earlier, we've been through one of the most divisive times in British politics with the Brexit debate, and Boris Johnson has, uh, took a side in that. And I think what's going to be really interesting now going forward is whether he. He's become an incredibly divisive figure. I mean, people either viscerally hate him or absolutely adore him. You know, there's very little in between. And uh, it'd be interesting to see what, how able he is to, to sort of get beyond that division and to try and bring the country together now. And I think a lot of it depends on how this is handled. I mean, he is, let's not forget, um, probably one of you know, the most astute politicians there is, irrespective of whether you agree with what he's doing or not. He has an incredible capacity to recognise what the public wants and to move in that direction, possibly to be led by them. And you know, you've seen some of that in some of his reassurances um, to workers, making workplaces COVID secure. I mean, let's not forget this was the man that used to rant about health and safety in the Daily Telegraph. Um, you know, making clear that the big difference between the, the 2008 financial crash and now is that we really want to look after working people. Now, this all feeds into his approach to the general election and, and sort of the, you know, the little red wall and trying to win back um, uh, certain voters or win certain voters to, to the Conservatives for the first time. 
you know, he, he, he has a great capacity to see what direction the public is going in. Now, whether he can, he can combine that, that sort of political astuteness with the realities on the ground of managing the detail and handling the science in what is undoubtedly the trickiest time quite for any government in probably decades remains to be seen. So I, I do want to move on to the question of business and what next and how business steps up. But one last question actually on, on government and it's to, so, to um, uh, John Swords about the app. I mean, we've seen massive adoption of technology across society over the last um, couple, couple of months. Um, but this, this, you know, the app, the mass collection of data, of public data, obviously marks a big, big shift, right? What's the kind of risk reward thing for government here? What's your view of the app? I think what the government wants to be able to have is a picture uh, uh, at the centre of how the virus is evolving through the country. Mm. And that's why they want to have an app where there is uh, with, with built-in privacy protections, where there is <clears throat> data in a central location that can be analysed and, and uh, used as a tool for, um, uh, uh, for, for managing the virus. <clears throat> I think the obstacle on this isn't going to be public opinion. Public opinion, as your survey shows, is behind it, just as it was when we were fighting the terrorists, and we still are fighting a, a campaign against terrorists. The public are behind the agencies who are responsible for this and are happy for, for data to be used. Um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, uh, I think the obstacle here is actually going to be the big tech companies, Google and Apple, who are going to impose a system with restrictions on European countries, not because of any uh, uh, necessary concern about how this um, uh, data might be used in Europe, but they want to have a consistent approach so they're not obliged to do the same in China uh, and other uh, repressive countries um, uh, uh, who, who might use the data for pure surveillance mm -hmm. questions rather than for public health issues. So <clears throat> I think the government is on the right track in terms of wanting to have a, 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 an overall picture. What the Google Apple facility will do, as I understand it, will simply provide individuals with information. It won't provide the government with an overall picture. And that's mm -hmm. what the government badly needs if it's going to steer and manage our way out of this in this very complex and, and, and nuanced, as you put it, um, uh, uh, emergence from lockdown. So uh, as we move our way through then and manage um, uh, through the recovery uh, or recovery of sorts, obviously business needs to move from the backseat to the front with government at least if government has still got its hands on the wheels business has got to be reading the map if you like but um uh, you know i think the expectation for business certainly in the eyes of government has, has has been raised over the last few months profits clearly cannot come at the expense of people anymore i mean let's get into that conversation so um helena what, what what are the steps do you think that business needs to take now to start to play a much more act active role beyond the kind of very laudable provision of things like PPE? Well, Ed, I think that your trust barometer has got some really clear pointers. Um, this concept of showing up and doing their part. I think um, what I've seen from the businesses that I'm involved with is that there has been a a pivot from the early weeks when there was a focus, understandable focus, correct focus on operational resilience, on making sure that clients were serviced, that remote working was working. There's been more of an emphasis on staff well-being, and I've seen that very, um, uh, very honestly and very genuinely. Um, but I don't think there's been much effort around the external communications and about being perceived to um, pr collaborate with either others in their sector or with the government to help with the planning of back to work and reopening the economy. And what I've seen um, in the past, and I'm going to be a bit candid here, is that when businesses have the opportunity to meet with government, then often a wish list comes out of all the things that the business or the sector needs must have to succeed. And it becomes a really rather one sided ask. And so I think businesses really need to change their tune at this point if they are going to be constructive and perceived as that that they need to be much more um, reaching out to the government in terms of what can we do for you, more of a partnership to solve the shared problem of how to regenerate the economy. I think that the, the um, risk, one of the big challenges, of course, is that many businesses are very impaired at present. So this list of things that people are looking for, hoping for from businesses for reassurance um, is going to have to be handled very carefully on an individual 
business by business approach because clearly um, there is a, a need for, in some businesses to make staff cuts and that's obviously going to create a lot of uncertainty and uh, undermine trust in uh, the recovery point. So I know we're going to come on to how do we regenerate and build on the hope that's needed but for now I think businesses really need to show that they're helping to find solutions with government and not waiting for the government to tell them what to do. John, can I, John Brown, can I pick up then this point with you, particularly about the, uh, you know, the performance of CEOs, because if you can imagine, you know, as Helena sets out, the, the new level of engagement between business and government now is going to be led by um, CEOs. And you, you've written a, a lot about leadership, and you've seen how underwhelmed people are in the visibility and role CEOs have played in the pandemic so far. What's your advice for CEOs of companies, big and small, as they move into this next, this next phase? Of course, uh, business, as opposed to investing, as opposed to politics, is about really getting things done. And so I think the first very obvious statement is that uh, businesses must have plans to get things done. Now, some of the things that they're going to do are accelerations of things which were evident in the past, which have been accelerated by uh, COVID-19. So I, I think uh, broadly the following, we make four points on where uh, CEOs need to go. The first is understanding, uh, as I think everyone now does, is that nature is a far more powerful thing than any government or prime minister or president. Uh, when it turns badly on humans, humans have to respond. So we've learned that and we, I think, will have a permanent role of businesses to think about health in particular. Why would we want uh, bad air now when people have been focused on their lungs for so long? So that will be a change. The second, and I believe firmly, is we've seen the, uh, we're seeing the results of a virus. We don't want to see the results of climate change. We just don't want to see those we must now take some real action, not just say it's a problem, isn't it? We actually have to do something about it and business has to do that. My, my second point is uh, the change that was beginning to happen in, in business, its partnership, its relationships around the world, in particular supply chains being broken, uh, different uh, trading relationships around the world are now becoming clearer. We will change the way in which we rely, I believe, on business relationships. We'll change the way we think about, for example, just-in-time inventories. Why would you want those? You need something to rely upon if something happens. So resilience is really important. And efficiency, which has been the big word, I think, of the past two decades, will be redefined. Efficiency isn't just about getting no, capa no spare capacity. Efficiency now is about actually being able to deliver properly. Thirdly, I think we could see from the results of, from the response to do the, uh, the virus, uh, it, this country is lacking an industrial base. Germany had an industrial base. It had medical equipment, the capability to test, a lot of practical, physical things. We don't have these things in this country. So the question for the future is how much more industrialization do we really need here? I would say much more. We cannot rely on software to do everything. We've forgotten the real relevance of hardware. And that's a good thing. And I think at the heart of almost everybody, they want to see uh, big nations deal with things which are hard, but as well as soft. My final point for CEOs is that they need to think about their understanding of science, risk, and resilience. Uh, I think the scientists uh, have uh, been uh, displayed very heavily uh, presently. Uh, they have a lot of work to do because, uh, because of our lack of industrial base, because of some bad decisions in the beginning, of this crisis, we have insufficient data. It'll take us time to really understand the data 
the risk and how business comes together, minimizing risk and maximizing well-being for their employees. That will take time and all CEOs need to be on top of that. Not, I think, doing their own particular correlations, being amateur data scientists, amateur uh, 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 people with uh, understanding of viruses, but actually we need a coherent approach to understanding risk in the nation. Uh, Joel, Joel Brown, briefly help me out here. Um, the, um, make the case for CEOs being an outlier um, in respect to issues like climate change, because you know, you've, you've worked in business your whole life. There is risk being out, 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 out front, if you like, on, on issues. And there is always a conservative nature, reluctance for business, particularly CEOs, to do that. Just briefly, what is the case for CEOs to be an outlier on these issues? Well, I, I think it's more apparent now that uh, you know, the forces, very big forces, make very big changes that are irreversible by uh, human beings. Uh, I'm always reminded uh, of uh, the points of uh, uh, when you speak to a great naturalist about the world. We're not trying to save nature. We're trying to save human beings as nature changes. If we're not, and, and if we induce bad change, we will cause a problem. So this, I think, our experience at the moment is yet another experience which says, be very careful to be as arrogant as we have been in the past, that we can control and tame everything in the world. We cannot. We may be able to solve our problem with the virus, with uh, better testing, both virological and serological, with uh, therapies and with a vaccine. But that's just one thing. If we start changing the way in which the world is put together, that's another. And I think that is more apparent to people today, I believe, than it was, let's say, two months ago. Acceleration of changes. Changes, uh, we, we'll talk about it uh, over this entire uh, webcast, is that so many of the things we talk about were already in train. Privacy, taking a back seat was already in train. Use of AI to solve certain problems was already in train. Uh, digitalization, what we're doing today, was already in train. We're now seeing it change a lot of things uh, on the margin, probably for permanently, changing the way we do business. Uh, I can't imagine that all boards, for example, will meet uh, physically every time they need to meet now. Um, you know, we'll learn something about, again, efficiency, we'll learn something about demand, it will have impacts on the way in which the global economy is put together. Um, uh, Sir, Sir John Source, one of the other big changes, of course, is the geopolitical landscape and for multinational companies who are moving into this recovery phase, things are starting to look quite different. I mean, thinking about the US-China relationship and that schism, for example. Um, what's your advice for companies now as they think about how they navigate the world post-COVID and these new relationships? Well, I, I think it's going to be an increasingly difficult geopolitical environment that global companies are operating in. Uh, we've seen the sharp downturn in the last two or three years of the US-China relationship. That's partly because of a more assertive approach from uh, Washington. It's also because of the changing nature of the Chinese uh, leadership and the Chinese regime. Um, <clears throat> both sides want to be independent of the other and remove their various commercial uh, dependencies. And as John Brown has just been saying, <clears throat> uh, we're going to see a, re a reversal of some aspects of globalization. We're going to see a move to simpler supply chains. Um, we're going to see uh, a move towards less uh, international dependence. And in the response to COVID, we've seen responses at a national level, which poses a real challenge for the European Union and for the Eurozone in particular. Um, and I think one, one thing we've not mentioned yet is the impact in the developing world in emerging markets. Mm. Uh, we don't yet know how virulent uh, coronavirus will be in places like Africa and India. It hasn't taken off in the same way yet, but I don't think there's any evidence to suggest it's just it's any more than just a matter of time. Uh, but they're certainly going to be hit very badly 
by the depression that we're now, the global depression that we're now entering. Um, uh, and I think we're going to see uh, a, a, a number of countries in very severe financial difficulties, in political difficulties, and we're going to see a reversal uh, of the trends on poverty. So there's a, the, the environment is going to become harsher, it's going to become more nationalistic, um, uh, and I very much hope we learn the lessons from 100 years ago when we had a pandemic and a depression, uh, uh, when there was a war both before and after it. I don't think there'll be a hot war, but we could have another cold war, which would be very divisive when it's between the world's two major economies. I think there's some very difficult navigation for companies to, uh, uh, to conduct now to uh, uh, find a way through this, which can, enables them to draw on China as a market without uh, adding to the dependency of Western economies on China. So it's just going to get way more complicated, you're saying, for, for business. It is. And, and when countries stand up to China, you look at the case of Australia at the moment. Yeah. Australians have made a very sensible uh, proposal for an independent international investigation into the causes of the crisis. And the mm -hmm. Chinese response is to slap, is to ban effectively uh, Australian beef exports to China and threaten the ban of all China and uh, all um, uh, uh, wine and other food products to China. I, China is becoming very aggressive in the way that it's defending its reputation. Um, and I think in some ways, uh, one perhaps good thing out, out of this crisis is some of the scales have fallen from the eyes of Europeans about the true nature of China uh, and the risks that China poses to our way of life um, uh, uh, in the same way that it did in America a few years ago. So we've got nine minutes left and I want to try and sort of move this to how, you know, firstly, how do you build rebuild shattered public confidence. Obviously that is crucial if we're gonna get the economy moving again and people uh, back in their offices uh, and businesses up and running. But then I do wanna leave at least a couple of minutes at the end for um, your, 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 your sense of what's the positive, if anything, that's come, come out of this. And John, John Brown has already touched on some, I think some very important points, particularly around uh, climate change. Um, Pippa, can I come to you first, thinking about your readers we see in the data that people are very frightened they're still very scared about the virus how how do you rebuild confidence in the public now how is that gonna how's that gonna work how does the government do it i think it's very hard i mean there's there's two there's two elements to it really aren't there there's, there's the um you know the trusting government element of the trusting companies bit um and so far um you know boris johnson's personal popularity um, with all the caveats that, that um, the rest of the panel have already uh, mentioned in his handling of the first phrase. Um, the fact that people want to trust a government in a national crisis, whether it's a, a war, a hot war, um, as John describes it, a in, you know, historic one, or, or um, the sort of the ongoing wars against things like terrorism, um, there's a real desire to. And also, don't, don't forget that it's only, I mean, goodness me, six months since Boris Johnson, since the government won an election with a massive majority. There's a lot of people out there that want this government to succeed, that wants to be proved right that they put their trust in them. So um, I do think that, there's, that there, is, um, there is a great deal of uh, potentially of support for the government and people wanting to trust them. I think what comes next, as we've all said, is the crucial bit. Um, we're now at a stage where uh, if things start to go badly wrong, there's, there's very little upside for the government and there's lots of downside risk. And already you're hearing um, people starting to talk about how we look back on what's happened with the handling of the coronavirus crisis and the potentially a public inquiry after we're through this and when we can sort of reflect and learn lessons, but presumably also examine mistakes and see where um, things could have been done Differently. Now that will be obviously a very dangerous moment for the government because it's very difficult to cast a narrative about your handling of the apparent success of a crisis by, you know, in terms of your own parameters, protecting the NHS, keeping the power flat, if a public inquiry subsequently finds that actually there were major mistakes made. So um, I think it's too early to say is the reality when it comes to retaining the trust in government, but it's very difficult time for it. Um, and companies very briefly um, I think there's two roles to play. I mean, you, you're all business people and you have much better insight into this than me. But, you know, you've all talked about sort of the outward facing bit about businesses. But, you know, just if I could add the inward facing bit and how businesses treat their employees. I mean, we're all employees. And I think that is really crucial, both now in the short term, getting through this and how understanding companies are about you know, 
working from home, um, people juggling with their families, having to dial in to, to work rather than doing it directly, all those things, but also coming out of it and sort of a recognition that there's a public expectation that companies, just like all of us, are going to have to take their hit. Um, and that actually it's about the people rather than the bottom line for the foreseeable. And I think it's quite interesting to see which companies rise to that challenge. I think they'll get a huge amount of public support if they do and which don't. Can I ask the same question then of Helena around um, rebuilding public confidence? I mean, Pippa sets out obviously the significant challenges, but how would you go about doing it? Well, I think um, I mentioned the word transparency before, and I think people are very um, sympathetic to the notion that this is a completely unprecedented, that we have never had a crisis like this before. But I think if the government's more transparent about the data and the background for why it's making its suggestions and decisions and honest about the potential for backward steps. I think that will really help build trust over time. I think we do need to come back to the hope factor and to focusing on positives, um, which might include a, a greater uh, focus on our local communities and our family lives and um, focusing on up, uh, leveling up as well. I think cities will be the last to recover. I do think in the short term, moving away from the social distancing tagline and talking more about physical distancing and social connectivity would help us to feel less that we can never talk to anybody. We know we can, but I think the small steps that just make people see that actually as we come out of this, um, we, we know we've learned things along the way and it's a question that came up about should we be looking at lessons learned just afterwards or now i think we should be noting all the changes that are positive um ability to re remote working which will help with the climate issue etc so i just think the government there's no magic wand that they can wave here there's no magic wand that businesses have it's about taking um very honest um very communicating really well being very transparent about the basis on which decisions are made yeah, I've been working. Can I have one point? Uh, yeah, please, John. Uh, so I, I think the government needs to recruit the British public uh, into finding solutions to these problems. Um, yeah. uh, your uh, Hugh was talking about um, business being solution oriented. I think the whole community needs to be in that way. As we're in a situation where there's a widespread fears, leaders in community, head teachers, uh, uh, bosses in, in, in employment places, uh, local police people, they need to find solutions to these problems, not find obstacles. And I, one thing watching what's happening in France at the moment, where the trade unions are, uh, are, are blocking the reopening of factories um, because they're, they're not satisfied that every process has been followed. I think yeah. the legal profession uh, uh, have a responsibility here in not obstructing things. We're in a, a, a national crisis and we all have to be part of finding solutions the way forward. I think the Prime Minister and others could do more to recruit the, the wider population into that solution-oriented mindset rather than a rather negative, fearful, uh, I'm only going to do something when I'm absolutely certain I'm safe mindset, which is sort of where the population is at the moment. Now, I, uh, John, John Brown. May I? I want to reinforce what Pippa said about uh, people uh, in business, employees. I, I think it's been the case, and we need to reinforce the case again and again, that the single most important thing is the inclusion of people and their well-being. And their well-being means their mental health as well as their physical health. And that's what CEOs need to do. But it's including everybody in that and making sure that the playing field is, remains, is made more level. That's point one. Point two, if I can, about the future, it's both a bittersweet message. I think when we come out of this, inevitably we will be a small, smaller economy. Uh, and for that, we need to focus on where our real strengths are and build for the future. That's in research and development. That's going to go, they take a very big hit during this process. We need to make sure we maintain what we can rebuild for the future, because the future of the United Kingdom will be written in that book, in the book of new innovation, new research, new development, and we need to keep reinforcing that, and that will give people hope, whether that is a breakthrough in pharmacology, whether it is a breakthrough in AI, whether it's a breakthrough in something that makes life just better for everybody, who knows, but I think it's those sorts of things that can give people hope.
John, I, I think that's an excellent way to end this discussion, actually. We are bang on um, 10 o'clock, and as someone who worked in TV for a long time, I'm always conscious of making sure we're out on time, and we are there or there, thereabouts. And I'm really grateful that all of the panelists actually ended this discussion looking forward and with a positive sense of where we can get to. And as you say, John, we're all going to be players, we're all going to feature in this book of... Britain, this new book that's being written, and um, I know, and I, and I hope collectively we're all going to play a very positive uh, part in shaping um, the country and its future as we move forward. So, for now, I'm enormously grateful to all of you. I know um, there's huge pressure on your uh, on your time, so to spend it with um, Edelman and with our clients and friends this morning, um, it's fantastic. So, thank you very much, and thank you to everybody um, who's been tuning in for the last hour. Thank you.